Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the College Admissions Collaborative Highlighting Engineering and Technology, or CACHE, College Fair. We are excited to have you participating in this event. We've had some fantastic schools here with us today. My name is Daisha, and I will be your facilitator. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, your camera and your microphone are off, so our panelists will not be able to hear or see you, but you can communicate with them using the Q&A button on your screen. So click that button and you'll be able to type your questions to our presenter and they can respond to you um, directly uh, during the presentation. This um, session has been one of many happening tonight, so if you um, we're not able to attend live. You'll be able to watch it later on demand and as well as any other sessions you might have missed. So you'll be able to visit strivescan.com slash cache to take a look at those recordings. So now I'd like to turn it over to our presenter from Harvey Mudd College. Still muted. There we go. Greetings to you all. Um, yes, my name is Peter Osgood from Harvey Mudd College. I've got some information for you about a really interesting school that is, I think, quite a bit different from just very, almost everything else out there. And um, what I'm going to, we're called the Liberal Arts College of Engineering, Science, and Mathematics. And I'm going to unpack that for you in just a bit. But first of all, um, I want to give you a sense of where we are, and that is Southern California, which is a lovely place to be. It means it's an area rich and diverse in food, cultures, geography. It has really pleasant weather most of the year. We really have two seasons, green and brown, and uh, we're about an hour away from an ocean. We're about an hour and a half from Palm Springs in the desert. These mountains are literally about 20 minutes away by automobile. They're, these are mountains up here, and you could get them quite easily for hiking, mountain biking, have, have good opportunities there. We're located here, which is about 50 kilometers inland from downtown Los Angeles. And in our town, it's called the City of Trees and PhDs, uh, a lot of trees around this area, but we're a part of the, we're a member of the Claremont group of colleges, a consortium of colleges. And I know that's uh, unfamiliar to some. So I'm gonna try and explain this to you. Think of this as a family of small private institutions that have agreed to be placed adjacent to each other and to work collaboratively together. So this is a rough map of the system, I'm including, there are seven colleges in this group. I'm only showing you five in this map here, but you can see these colleges are absolutely contiguous. What separates Harvey Mudd from Pitzer is a large rock in a bush. It's not even a street. There is a street across from Scripps. My office is right about here, but I could literally get the Scripps in about a minute and a half. Uh, another two minutes, I'd be at Claremont McKenna College. Another minute and a half, I'd be at Pomona College. So it's very easy to make friends, to connect with uh, more, a more diverse and a deeper, broader range of courses because all of these undergraduate college students are registering from the same portal for some 2,500 or so courses that are available. And all those courses meet at identical times of the day. So it's very easy for a student to take a course at a certain time of day at one college, and then that course will end and it gives you another 15 minutes to get to another college for a different class. So altogether, this is about 6,000 students undergraduate. And as I mentioned before, there are two graduate schools in the mix, but they're really kind of out of sight and out of mind for us. This is a unique situation. As far as we know, this is the only planned consortium of small colleges in the country. We share some facilities and we work together. Uh, there are support services for students who identify with different groups. There's chaplain for people who want to follow religious practices or have some fellowship. There is a massive library. We pool our resources for these student support services 
And uh, we also have many, many more clubs and organizations that students can join because of this consortium. So when I say think, I'd like you to think about this as a family. Can you imagine if you have a cousin who lives next door to you and in that cousin's house, you can go and play with their toys. They're gonna to come to your house to celebrate your birthday. But can we agree that your room is in your house and the rules are slightly different from in your house than in your cousin's house? So that's kind of the way I'd have you imagine the system working. Uh, it has, uh, you might think there would be five athletics teams or perhaps just one. In fact, we have two. This is the only place I know of the away team would dress at home and literally go a block and a half and play an away game. And I will also say the most popular intramural sport is inner tube water polo, which you should try. It's a lot of fun. We are within the group of colleges, the one that is STEM focused. And what one of the things that makes MUD stand aside from a lot of other institutions is there are very few high powered STEM institutions that also exclusively serve undergraduates. And we are one of those places. I think it's a huge benefit for us to a student to have every resource at the school devoted to your progression to, towards your bachelor's degree. This mission statement was written by our first president who had who turned away an opportunity to work on the Manhattan Project. So we've always had at our heart an, a desire to understand the implications of our work in STEM. And that figures into the way we structure our academic program. We're also the smallest college of the group in Claremont with only 900 undergraduate students. It's also a diverse community. The first year class has one more male student than female student. It's virtually 50-50. It's about 20, almost 25% Latinx. It's about 20% Asian, about 20% white. It's about 15% uh, who are multi-ethnic. It is about 17% who identify Black African American. It's about 9% international. It is, a, it is an intentionally mixed cohort of peers that you'll be working with. And that is very important to us because we want students to look at solving problems from different lived experiences and different perspectives. So I mentioned this mission is, is really critical to us. It drives all major decisions at the college and in, it not only informs, but our academic program is married to it. So this is kind of the big picture structure of our academic program. And I'm gonna break these down into pieces. The first chronologically, I would argue in terms of importance is this. It is a common core curriculum. By common, I mean every student will take every one of these courses in yellow. And this is a different core curriculum than the students who would have been your predecessors would have completed. It is a thinner, skinnier uh, core uh, to try and give students a, a different, a better balance in sort of work and life there. But as a consequence, you're pretty much in lockstep with required courses in your first year. So as a result, a student doesn't dive directly into a major, nor will we select students based on their major. In fact, you're not allowed to, to select a major in your first year. So that's a little bit different about a STEM institution. I would also say that a big benefit of this is that when you choose your major, you're actually making an informed choice. And so I think a lot of high school students might think of biology one way, but our faculty think of it in a very different way or a high school senior to know that they wanna be an engineer when they have, may not have taken any courses in engineering, that seems to me fraught with all kinds of possibilities, maybe good, maybe not so good. So we'll delay that choice for you. The second value to this core is that we really connect these things. By the time you are taking this course, the faculty know you've already learned multivariable calculus and computer, you've learned how to code. So this is a far more quantitatively oriented introductory course than most colleges would dare do to a first time biology student. 
So my point is that we're consciously trying to help students see connections across various disciplines rather than put, putting them in silos. And that's very important because that's where innovation occurs. It's where some of the most exciting research evolves. And we want to put you in that space. The uh, third benefit of this core curriculum is that it shares conversations and experiences across our entire student body. So if you're in this course in mechanics and you're having difficulty in that in, in a project assignment or uh, a, a homework, who can help you? Literally the entire student body because every sophomore, junior, and senior will have taken that course and every other first year student will be in that course with you. So the culture of our school is tremendously collaborative. And we actually don't work very well for students who wanna just plow through this on their own, are unwilling to ask for help, and particularly for those who are unwilling to give it because they can isolate themselves. And when they do need help, they could be in some, some more difficult circumstances. So the collaboration is really a key part of the way that we uh, introduce the learning process. To further support that, the first term is actually not graded. It's a pass or no credit system. I can get into more detail about some of these courses and why we position them where we do. Uh, I'll remind you, this is a proposed core curriculum. The faculty are revising this core curriculum from what it had been in a previous instance, the current instance. Uh, it's already in transition. So this core curriculum is fundamental to what we are and it ties in perfectly with our mission, broad basis of understanding and skill. This is also a key part. We don't prescribe the courses in this area of the curriculum, but we work best for students who actually have an appetite to take courses that are not in STEM. So we don't want you to sacrifice those interests in philosophy or dance or sociology on the altar of science. We won't let you. Uh, we have a structure in mind that you take four, five courses in very different fields, and then you have just short of a minor. You were required to do this, to have just short of a minor. We call this a concentration in something here. So you, in completing these requirements, you, would, you could meet them in one of three ways. You could meet some of these through a study abroad program, you could cross register for other colleges in Claremont. You could take those at MUD. And the, so we offer courses in these disciplines, but not all of them, but most of them. Uh, so you could certainly take a good number of the courses at Harvey MUD College, but you also will have uh, more choices once you look beyond our, our borders to a neighbor college or the study abroad programs. So, on to the next. This is the entire list of majors that we provide. I would characterize them in two ways. The first is we have these combination majors, which were driven largely out of student desire and demand. The one that I think is particularly appealing, and I could not think of a more relevant time, is this one. This is a, an extremely rare major at the undergraduate level. This is far more common at the graduate school level. But we can do this because students have been interested in this, these combinations of, of disciplines and we've put them together for you. So you don't have to double major in those cases. And then uh, uh, overloading means more courses and a heavier academic load. The other characterization I'd have is you'll note that we have a single major in these fields. We don't have a separate major in say marine biology and that's different from a molecular biology major. We have a single major in biology, a single major in physics. We have a single major in engineering, and that is unusual. Um, what is important is that this is a board certified engineering program, but we are producing problem solvers. And so the, this is maybe a good example to use for any one of our departmental majors. So I'm gonna use engineering as my, as my case. The student in engineering would take a series of courses required for anyone in the major that were, are applicable to many fields within engineering. So this would be courses like material science, thermodynamics, uh, digital systems and processing. Uh, it'll be a lot of systems engineering. 
And all those can find are going to be sort of the surrounding parts of mechanical, electrical, chemical, engineering, and so on. What will happen then is the students in, in this discipline will choose elective courses that dovetail with their primary interests. So they see themselves more as an industrial engineer or a biomedical engineer. Sure, we have uh, advanced courses for you in those fields and off you trot and you focus, although your degree will simply say that you majored in engineering. But this approach, whether it happens in math or physics or chemistry or whatever, puts a lot of pressure on this college to offer a lot of deep courses so students don't run out. Uh, if any of you is so excited about math that you would choose to major in math, we offer you collectively in Claremont 140 math courses. So I think the chances of you running out of math courses are quite low. But it also puts a lot of pressure on us to have a lot of research and project work for our students to do that deeper dive. And I got good news for you, we are an undergraduate school. So the only people that our faculty can work with for the research projects are people like you. People who are, we have set asides for first year students. We have uh, projects for students over the summer. We will pay about 20, 25% of our entire student body each summer to do research alongside our faculty for about typically 10 weeks. You don't have to engage research early in your career, but it, it might enhance your resume. It might be a, a springboard to an internship later on, who knows? But let's say you don't engage in research early in your career. By your senior year, you must. And so depending on the major that you choose and your interest within that major, you would either do a senior thesis, would be typical of say a, a, a pure mathematician, a string theorist, a laboratory-based discipline like chemistry. But if your interests flow more toward the applied side, uh, you, instead of doing a senior thesis, you would do clinic. So clinic is required for every engineering major, every computer science major, but we also have clinics in math and physics, and less commonly a biologist or chemist would, would join them. Basically what happens in clinic is that we have projects that are sponsored by outside organizations, usually from industrial clients, but it could be a think tank, a national lab, and they have paid us about $50,000 and they've given us a research and development problem to work on. And we select a team of about five or six students to solve this research problem in a year. And since these companies have paid us, thank you very much, they would like to have a return on their investment. So we actually deliver and it's really fun for our students to work on projects no one else has done before, to be innovative, to meet a budget and to provide this deliverable. And uh, not infrequently, we make patent disclosures from our students' work. We're gonna give away the intellectual property rights for these programs, but uh, it's, we insist that our students are listed on any, uh, uh, any patent that is resolved from one of these projects. But you can see you're gonna work very much in step with industry on live projects, very excited program, and a very a much a signature program for our college. This all turns out quite nicely, the way we structure our academic program for the aspirations that our graduates have. We have traditionally been a school that sends one of the highest percentages of its graduates to PhD programs in the United States. So we're, we're near the top of that list annually. We also have a very good story to tell in terms of employment, which is more popular, uh, partly because these companies offer pretty substantial salaries to our graduates. And why is that? Well, think of what we're packaging for our students. They're gonna be very strong communicators. They have to do a lot of public speaking. They have to do a lot of writing at this college. They're gonna be able to work across disciplines and see connections across disciplines. They're gonna be able to work in teams. They'll have had experience working on long, hard problems. They have been produced as problem solvers. So that's all really attractive to employers. And I'll add another piece is it's a diverse community and employers are eager for that. So that they're, they're, whatever they're producing is something that is gonna be relevant socially 
and uh, be influenced by the by who is going to be the ultimate user. So we have a very good story to tell in, in terms of uh, potential outcomes for our graduates. But the best story is the kind of people that you'll be interacting with. And this is a small college. It's unusually close knit. There is ample numbers of things to do. I mentioned some of the athletics. There are nine acapella groups. Our students are significantly overrepresented in music and arts organizations. A lot of students take to heart part of our mission statement to have an impact on society. And so there are specific activities designed for our students to engage, community service activities, things like that. You're seeing a picture on the left of a maker space, and that's a little bit obsolete because we have just built a brand new space that is absolutely phenomenal. The, the basement section of that building is a massive maker space for the students. And I'll just say they make interesting things and most of what they make is legal. Uh, there's also a fun for our students to hang out with professors on a social basis to get to know them a bit more as people rather than just the persons who are helping grade your, your homework assignments and giving you those assignments and tests. So we're trying to build a very strong community here. Another factor in building that community is our core curriculum. Another is the, that sort of sense of shared experience. Another is that we are a residential college. If you are eager for Greek life, you'll have to be content with math and physics because that's where you'll see deltas and epsilons and lambdas and sigmas and gammas. We don't put those symbols onto buildings. We have nine residence halls. We intentionally put first year students into each of these residence halls and then surround them with peer academic leaders, mentors, proctors. This is a very difficult place to sort of slip through the cracks. There's a lot of people looking out for you. And this is a, also a, an unusual situation where the upper class students are really excited to meet the new arrivals and look out for them, almost like a big brother, big sister kind of a thing. And if you're slaving away on a difficult assignment, they may be, make a batch of cookies for you or have a little celebration after you finish that big assignment because they know what it was like. And I'll remind you that first term is past no credit. So sometimes they'll urge you not to do the homework assignment. Enough is enough, let's go play. So there's a really good community feeling at our school. Another example of this is there's an unwritten rule in our dining hall that every table can accommodate N plus one. So I really like that, that people are very inclusive. And there's some, uh, as, as I mentioned before, it's a, it's, it's a wonderfully tight-knit community. I would also say that the traffic on our campus can only go east or west. So you're probably going to see the same faces again and again. And that builds a sense of maybe camaraderie and, and feeling of belonging. But know that you can leave our campus behind by heading south for just a few minutes and you're going to be on another college's campus. And so there's an even greater number of friendships, relationships, activities to pursue. All right, so in terms of the application process, a few things to point out here. In the main, our, our selection process and application process is quite similar to many other schools. We use either the coalition application or the common application. We don't care which. We get the same information regardless. The key features that are different are that we specify that the teacher recommendations must come from disparate fields. One has to come from a teacher in a field like English or history or economics, something like music, something in the humanities, social sciences, or arts. And then one has to come from a math or science instructor. Sure, project lead the way or computer science is fine, but. Um, you're going to get to that. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll need to have recommendations from both of those fields. We are test. We were test optional last year. I'd like to point this out to you. I think this was was really interesting. Of the applicants last year, almost an identical proportion of those who applied and almost an identical proportion of those who were admitted did not have test scores. I'm not saying that each individual student won. We didn't do it that way. And about 39% of the students enrolled at the college in our first year class did not report to us test scores. 
So we literally mean that you do not need to have test scores. Your test scores will not enhance your application in significant ways. If you have them to report, you would self-report them and that's just fine. I also want to point out this as I believe an anomaly, two key factors affected this for us much lower admit rate than we normally would have. Normally it's closer to 20%. One is that the number of applicants increased. Another is that a good number of spaces in this current first year class were already committed by students who'd been admitted the prior year and had deferred admission. That was about 15% of the incoming class. So that made far less space for us to admit students who applied last year. By contrast, the number of students who are deferring from the fall of 21 to the fall of 22 is a total of one person. So I think things will open up this year and our admit rate will, will uh, refit back to what it had been before, which I, again is closer to 20%. One more thing to talk about is that we have um, curricular expectations by the time you enroll for your first year. These are not truly admission requirements but they are requirements for a student to enroll. So the student needs to have a year long high school course or an equivalent college course in calculus, in chemistry and in physics. It does not need to be an AP course. It does not have to be crowded into your junior and senior year, but it needs to be a year long course or two distinct semesters where it's clearly a, a course in those areas. We are not this is admit, being admitted to our college is not an arms race. It's not a matter of who's taken two more AP courses than somebody else or who has an iota higher GPA. Our selection process is really focused on the kind of culture, community, academic program we offer. So we're looking for hints about the students' attitudes towards the way they learn, what they learn, with whom they learn, who they interact with socially, how they support them, how they get supported by them. Those kinds of qualities are ones we really zone in on in the selection process and reading your applications. So we're really trying to find a good match with who the student is and how it fits within our kind of community. So we're gonna look very carefully at things like teacher recommendations, We'll notice what kinds of things attract you extracurricularly. We'll look for statements from you in essays and short answers. So we'll try and get a sense of your value system as best we can. We are need blind in our selection process for every US citizen and US permanent resident. We are not so for international students. So we are need aware for international students. Thus, an international student who does who needs financial assistance is in a much tougher position for, for gaining admission. I am proud that we offer we need 100% of every student's calculated need based on the FAFSA and the CSS profile and the copy of the family's taxes. We offer a good 25% or so of the admitted students a merit scholarship or a combination of merit scholarships. Most of those are simply assigned to the student without the student even applying for them. Uh, there are only three of perhaps nine merit scholarship programs that students could even apply for. And we intentionally set the deadline to apply for these three, two in robotics and our president scholars program, about two weeks after the admission deadline has passed, the application for admission deadline. So this gives us time to identify who has applied and send a message to applicants that invites them to apply for these three, knowing that the other ones we're simply going to assign to candidates. I also like that our default rate on student loans is zero and we're very keen on you, and I think your parents may be as well, that you will graduate in eight semesters. So with that, I, uh, there are other ways to engage with us. Uh, we are doing virtual admission interviews that we have a, a standard set of questions that we will ask people. So this won't be daunting and be entirely predictable. 
And most of the people doing the interviews are our own students who've been trained as interviewers. So it's gonna be a much more easy conversation for you to engage. And hopefully you'll be able to pick their brain about what, they, what their experience at MUD has been. If you're interested in getting some more information, you can send me an email. Uh, here's my contact information here. If you want a PDF of our brochure, uh, our microsite is probably a great place to start if you're just becoming familiar with our college, but there are all kinds of ways for you to engage with us virtually. We are offering in-person tours if you're able to get to our campus, and we do have some virtual tour uh, programs available for, for people as well. So with that, I think I'm going to stop the share, and I see I have one question here about a co-op and have another um, Q&A here. Do we offer a, a co-op, oh yeah, but a co-op program. So the, we do not offer a co-op program. I would argue that our clinic uh, requirement for students in computer science engineering is more robust than a typical co-op program. It is a course that you take while your other courses are going on. So budgeting your time, working with your peers is critical. Uh, it is, uh, uh, that's how we approach this. I would also say that our career services office is very, very strong and our students might well find themselves with internships over the summers. Some of those pay quite handsomely. All right. so. That was the first question in the q and I'm wondering if somebody else has other questions, if there are questions you want to ask me about other components, the Claremont system, more about components of our academic program, research opportunities, uh, what people do for giggles, favorite festivals around here or, or activities that we do more about admission, cost, financial aid, I am fair game. And if there are no questions, um, we may wrap up a little bit early, but we'll see. So I hope you'll have an opportunity, you'll, you'll take the opportunity to signal me if anything comes to mind. In the summer, well, most of our students are not here in the summer, only about maybe 25% or so, either work, either, either we've hired them to work for an administrative position or they're doing research, paid research with our faculty. And in that case, if you're doing research, it's a 40 hour a week job. And if re with research, your schedule gets kind of inconsistent. There may be a certain day where you're gonna look, work more than eight hours and other days where you're waiting for some results to be to be coming through, so you're going to go to the beach instead or, or hang out together. Um, we do have some summer courses as well, so there's some students, a little bit more than maybe 25% of our students on campus. But um, the students might go back home, they might join a, a classmate or a friend to live with them while they're pursuing an internship. Uh, their internships could be all over the country and so there are a lot of different things to do in the summer, but the campus is not nearly as full or residential in the summer as it is during the academic year. Um, what research are you able to do as undergraduates? Well, virtually every department here has a full boat of, fa of, of faculty working on research. A little bit smaller proportion amongst the faculty in humanities, social science, and arts, but even there is our research opportunities. So we have a process that a student here will get bombarded with information to uh, apply for various research programs. Some of them might only be able to take a handful of students. Some might take more like 20 people. And you don't need to have prior experience in these fields, it seems to me, that the most important characteristic the faculty want is that somebody is eager to learn and will be invested in, uh, you know, be disciplined about that, that, uh, that assignment. And the, the, if you stay with that particular type of research, you'll find yourself very quickly with a growing sense of independence, 
a knowledge of how to construct research programs and how to basically fail to succeed. Um, ask for help, share your findings, enjoy and enjoy the breakthroughs that you have where the, you know, the clouds part and the angels come down and sing for a bit. Those are, those are key moments. So uh, it's also the case that you don't have to do research in the field you think you're going to major in. You could be a, a physicist who does research in the biology department or the, a chemist who does research with the engineers, vice versa. It's really quite, quite open. So again, we're not siloed. The research programs are really plentiful and they're rich. We do some really extraordinarily good research here um, and very good facilities. I think, for example, in the chemistry department, there are probably three really high quality machines for every student, junior and senior in that department. So we're, we're well outfitted. Uh, some of the research projects students get to work on. Yeah, so, um, we, uh, one of my, there, there's, a, there's a set of projects in biology, one that they do sort of an, an environmental study by how lizards adapt to various temperatures and, and climate changes. There's another one from the world of biology that studies the social behavior of insects like bees and ants. Uh, there's other ones where they're uh, replicating uh, chemical processes to to enhance a uh, better output for um, solar panels, things like that. In engineering, you're gonna find uh, some, some exciting, one of the exciting ones is called the um, layer. And basically our students uh, are working with this professor and they build things that look like small missiles. They're probably about two meters long and they're, um, they're autonomous. So they stick these in the ocean and they track sharks' social behavior and where they tend to go. And then they collect that data and figure some things out about people. There's a robotics lab that's very popular called the uh, heat lab. We, um, uh, in uh, one of our mathematics professors does research on backgammon. So he hires his students to, <laughs> to basically play backgammon and to study it mathematically. So there's all kinds of different areas to go into. And um, yeah, pretty exciting stuff. So um, I would also say that it, to give you a sense of the quality of this research, it is not rare for a MUD student to go to present their findings at a conference. And in some occasions, our students are the only undergraduates at a conference that is designed for graduate students. So I think that speaks highly of the type of research we do. Is there a report on the percentage of enrollments by state? Not really, but in our profile, we have it broken down by kind of regions of the country without specifying each state. Please keep in mind that we enroll a first year class of about 220 people. So two people is largely 1% of the class. And we have, if we have like eight people from Virginia, that's actually a thing for us. So, so the percentages can get kind of distorted when you got a small n like that. Um, the study abroad programs, and they're more than just a semester, they could be summer programs as well. And those are being revitalized for this coming spring. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we had record numbers of students doing study abroad programs. And the changes in our core curriculum enable these study abroad programs far better than uh, the previous iterations of our core. So I think that's a good probability that the students will have robust opportunities to conduct their uh, study abroad experiences. They can be really informative and give you a better sense of, of uh, chart your pathway. I've seen occasions where students actually came back from that program and changed their major to accommodate their new perspective on things. Uh, that's not often that, that happens. We hope it doesn't happen. Keep in mind also that we're part of this consortium in colleges where there are students who are studying, say, Spanish or French or Russian, and they might have study abroad programs that we can uh, uh, ping, ping, piggyback onto for our students or other programs. I would also say that we have faculty here who are the lead 
uh, faculty support for a, a really exciting program that's attractive to students in uh, mathematics and computer sciences in Budapest. And there have been some really great experiences there to say nothing of being in a place that's so different from the United States. So, whew, I've been going a long time. That's a really great, you're welcome. Um, we only have a few more minutes. We're gonna close this thing down in about five minutes. And um, uh, I don't know if you all, I, I, let me try this. I have a joke for you. Um, I hope this won't offend because it's a little bit dicey if, if people have sensitivities that could get rattled by this. But here's my joke. A female statistician gives birth to twins. She and her husband are really excited about this. They contact their relatives. They post this on Facebook. They end up contacting their minister. They say, look, we're expecting one child, but we got two. The minister says, hey, that's great news. Bring them both on Sunday. I will baptize them both. She says, oh, no, no, we should keep one as a control. So I think that's fine. You know. uh, with that, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, um, we're, <laughs> we're, we're about, we're, we're about over, uh, not, not quite over our time, but we're, we're clearly wrapping up here. Um, I wanna thank you for your attention to this program. Hope it's been useful for you. Uh, please feel welcome to engage us later. Uh, if you can get to our campus to tour, I think it'll be really inspirational and you'll really see what makes this place fly, which is, which is the people here. It's really a dynamic group of people who are actively looking to support you. So please do if you can. Uh, I will just put into the chat here, um, my contact information once again, if any of you wish to reach me by email, is that correct? Yes. Uh, please capture that and send me a message if you have more follow-up questions, or if your family members do, your counselor, teacher, what have you. So thank you. With that, I think we're about to close in. Thank you. Aisha, it's your turn. Awesome. Thank you, Peter, for this wonderful presentation on Harvey Mudd College. I have just one more slide to share with you all before we wrap up. So thank you to Peter and thank you to all of you who have attended tonight's session. When you close out of this window, you will see a brief five question survey. Please take a moment to fill that out and we appreciate any feedback you can provide. Um, I encourage you to visit strivescan.com slash cache to view the recording of tonight's session as well as any other sessions you are interested in looking at. Um, and that is all we have for tonight. So thank you once again, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Great to meet you. Thank you so much. Great. Good luck. Thank you. Bye. Bye.